Just a quick one before we get into this episode. If you're in the UK and you use supplements, I'd highly recommend checking out Reflex Nutrition, where they're giving up to 40% on all their range if you use the code PTRNT at checkout. I've been using Reflex for nearly a decade, with their microwave being one of my favorite whey proteins. It's grass-fed, hormone-free, and digests so well compared to most on the market. Check out their full supplement range, including your, all your transformation basics and plant-based alternatives on reflexnutrition.com and use the code PTRNT at checkout for up to 40% off. It's not long left now until the new book, Transform Your Body, Transform Your Life is released. Sunday 24th of May is the big day and I can't wait for you to get your copy. Make sure you subscribe to our email list and social media for updates on book bonuses, previews, competitions and giveaways. Exciting times ahead. On today's episode of Orange Fitness Radio, I'm joined by Rushab Sabla, founder of one of the most credible physiotherapy teams around, r and Physio. In this episode, we'll dive into how you can stay proactive in bulletproofing your body against injury, the psychology of recovery, balancing pain and performance, the most common injuries he sees in his clinics, as well as the most common myths that perpetuate the physiotherapy world. Where this episode gets interesting is where Rushab takes you through specific movement screens you can try while listening to assess any niggles, pains or issues throughout your body. I've uploaded a video to this episode to YouTube and linked this in the show notes for you to watch. At the end, you'll also hear Rushab take me through some online physio for my existing shoulder issues. In fact, just after we got off air, we continued the session and I was able to do my first set of push-ups that I've done in over a month since having this, this, since having this shoulder injury. Which brings me to an exciting announcement, whereby I've partnered up with Rushab to bring the power of online physiotherapy to the RNT community. There's nothing worse than being injured. It stops us from doing what we love. Staying healthy, pain-free, and being able to perform at your best is an important part of the process. So if you've picked up a niggle, struggling with an injury, or want to bulletproof your body for optimal performance, don't wait any longer. Head to rntfitness.com forward slash physiotherapy to book yourself in with Rushab and his team so you can get back to doing what you love and being at your best. I've put the link in the show notes for ease too. The beauty of the way Rushab works is it's all online, so you can benefit from his expertise anywhere in the world. It goes against the grain of what you may think when it comes to typical physiotherapy, but there's plenty of research to now show and support that's in fact adherence to rehabilitation practices and exercises that's the key to recovery, not hands-on manual therapy. This is a game-changing addition to our transformation arsenal, and it's exciting to be able to share this news with you. Injuries aren't fun, and if you train hard, there may be a chance you come across them. Head to www.rncfitness.com forward slash physiotherapy and bulletproof your body today. So how's life in a quarantine as a physio? Oh, I think it's uh, it's great, although I've never sat this much in my life. <laughs> uh, for the amount of people um, that have a day job that involves sitting for eight hours or plus, um, I can now feel their pain, um, literally. So uh, it's interesting to see how body mechanics and everything changes uh, in a short space of time, first of all. But as a physio, we're so used to movement, and uh, whether it's in the clinic or going into the gym setting uh, or opening the doors for someone, walking, um, you know, getting that sort of uh, short amount of activity done. Uh, to break up your day now for for me to sit at a desk because we're online physios now uh, for us the transition has been uh, it's been pretty interesting i can i can i can really empathize with those with back pain now what has uh, your step count gone down from gone down to from i think i was averaging like fifteen thousand steps naturally um every day that's just with the work that we do and stuff uh the one day i didn't do anything 700 yeah <laughs> welcome to my life <laughs> i remember that transition from being a pt to going online yeah and the idea of thinking about steps was foreign to me because i was clocking 15k without even thinking about it you know walking up and down the gym floor racking yeah. weights right moving moving from client to client and then all of a sudden you're just sitting on your ass all day long and uh, you've now got to think about movement uh it's a whole different lifestyle that takes a bit of uh adjustment yeah, so for sure for sure. And I think in the physio aspect, nothing's really changed uh, dramatically. I do miss the touch. I think there's something about the human touch that you can't replicate. 
But uh, transitioning online for us has been um, natural, very natural. In fact, it's, it's something that we were surprised how natural it's been for a lot of our clients because they were like, this is exactly the same um, way you guys are in clinic setting. So it's great to see also the team kind of work along that same mentality. So it's been brilliant in that sense um, from the physio perspective. But uh, yeah. I was actually talking to Nathan about it uh, the other day and I was saying, we were talking about the concept of uh, online physio and he was like, well, actually, it makes no difference because the two key things for rehab are adherence and the exercises. Yep. Adherence yep. to the exercises, in, they're two different things. We, we, we call it compliance. I think that's the word, yep. that they're, they're complying to the exercise. Yeah. Not just your R&T program or any other program that you're doing. It's no, 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 no. the rehab program. Yeah, so it's doing the rehab exercises and then being compliant to those rehab exercises. And the touch and the, the massage and the manipulation and all of that actually has... Yeah comparatively a lot less effect. Is that correct? Or uh, Yeah, absolutely. So science will now show that actually when you go and get your hands-on treatment done, um, like the effect of say, uh, for example, we stretch, right? Everyone stretches. Um, and say uh, the effect of a stretch is only 20 minutes. Um, if I was to sort of put you back into a scan or measure the muscle length or something like that, nothing really would change. Um, the same thing goes for manual touch. So manual touch is nice because all I'm doing is I'm actually changing. Uh, we have what we call a substance P fiber. It's, it's, it's substance P, which is basically released when I touch you. So when I, when I hold on to, you know, when someone puts your hand on your shoulder just to say, Hey, it's going to be okay. Yeah. You know how instantly you feel a bit of, actually, you know, it's, it's comforting. Mm. That's the power of human touch. So all we're doing is just breaking that pain level from your shoulder to your brain and saying to you actually, Hey, uh, let's interrupt that signal. And as soon as I interrupted that signal with manual therapy, you'll have a window of opportunity to now do your rehab, do your exercise and all of that. Now, I'm not saying no to manual therapy. I'm, not, I'm saying it's not the most important thing. Uh, but unfortunately, as physios, we've been pretty bad at um, sort of putting out that message. So most people who go to see a physio, chiro, osteo, health professional will always want the hands on first before they have anything else um, in terms of education, empowerment, or in any of the knowledge side of things. Um, and rightly so. I, I, do feel, I do feel there is a place for it, but I don't necessarily think it's the most important. Um, and in this time, the COVID, my industry is, oof, everyone is worried. There are people who down their tools, or physios who, who are constantly hands-on and seeing maybe 20 patients a day for 15 minutes a pop or 20 minutes a pop or 30 minutes a pop with a quick crack or adjustment or whatever they like to mm -hmm. call it. All of a sudden, they're out of business, and um, they're now making the transition to online. But unfortunately, they're, they're, they've been too slow um, because for them to change their methodology, that's going to take a long time. Uh, it's going to take a long, long uh, period of uh, transition. You have to be practicing what you preach um, as a practitioner. Yeah, I was surprised when we had our shoulder session uh, a couple of weeks ago, which we can talk about later on. Uh, yeah. I think it will be a really good example for this podcast. Um, and I was surprised at how little manual therapy you actually did. Like I, I was almost hoping for a rub down for 30 minutes, you know, <laughs> you know, when, uh, you know, you yeah. pain in your back or pain in your shoulder, you just want someone to rub it down and make you feel better because yeah. it, it does feel great, right? You, you yeah. leave the place and for the next uh, couple of hours, you feel awesome. Yeah. Maybe the day and then, and then two days later, you're like, Oh, actually nothing's really changed. I've got to do the rehab. That's it. That's it. And it's literally that. It's like that, they've created that window of opportunity. So they've dulled down your pain response from your body mm. and they've said to you, here's a window, seize the moment, go into your rehab. And you've got to treat it like training. You see, where, where most people make a mistake is they see it as two separate entities. It's not. It's part of your training. Um, if you want to bench press and you're not doing your rehab, there is very little chance that your shoulder is going to improve to be able to bench press pain free. Mm. And if you don't make that link, um, it will, and if the physio is not communicative enough or, or not good at their, their skills of sort of connecting the dots, unfortunately, you're just going to see this as a piece of paper or an app or some few exercises that have less importance than what you do, like a bench press movement. Um, how many times have you gone to the gym and said, do you know what? I'm so excited for that bench press. Every time it's a body day. Okay. How many times have you gone and picked up that piece of band and said, I'm so excited for that rehab exercise? Never. <laughs> I had to lie in bed the other day. I actually had to lie in bed the other day and I had to write down. I, was, I had my journal in my hands and I had to write down, I need to do my rehab more consistently because I'm doing it three to four days a week. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, I really, I should be doing it maybe 47 days. 
And then some days I'll do it. I'll do three of the, so, you know, um, you said do three, at least three exercises. Yeah. So some days I'll do three and then some days I'll do one and then some days I'll do two. But in my head, that's not quite ticking the box. So this week I've, I've actually held another level of accountability. I've told, um, I've told uh, Nathan, that's my other half. Uh, and I've, now I'm telling you on this podcast, I said like, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show you uh, the seven boxes ticked on a day to day basis, because it's right. very easy to think, um, short term when, when it comes to rehab. And if it's not better in a, in a day or in a, in a week, or even in that 30 minute rub down, then yeah. it's not going to get better. And it can be yeah. easy to feel demotivated and lose hope that you will get better. And, and that's For something sure. that's probably worthwhile touching on. Like how do you deal with that mental aspect of physiotherapy? So, so when people come to our clinic, for example, or I have a consultation online, the first thing I do is I send them a, a, a um, we talk and we understand why it's so important and what's so important. And then I kind of explain what science with body healing is. If your tendon needs to rehab or get better, it will take three months. And if you've had that shoulder issue for five years or four years ongoing, and you're going to someone and you've gone to see them maybe three or four times, which is where we see the dip in motivation. So the first two to three weeks is brilliant. But then right after that, there's that bit of dip coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's where we say catch yourself because this is the perfect point to even sort of launch with more rehab and staying to the same program. The program doesn't need to be fancy. I mean, it's nothing sexy about like physio exercises using them. It's more about the, the mental and connecting the dot. And also when people go down at that rabbit hole, this is not working for me, or I don't know if this is the right physio, or I don't know if my shoulder's got that injury. Um, you're going to see an expert, first of all, or someone who knows a little bit more than you would in, in, that, uh, in, that, in that particular sort of point. They're going to be spending probably three quarters of their um, consult asking you specific questions, asking you specific directive questions, which give them an answer and almost do a process of elimination. Oh, well, it's not this, it's not this, it's not this, it's definitely this, it could be this, and there's another differential diagnosis. Now, with all those, all that information, they're giving you a time frame. So they're giving you that frame to say, hey, it's going to be 12 weeks. And at two weeks, I expect this. At four weeks, I expect this. At six weeks, I expect this. It's very important, one, for the physio to actually be able to do that and consistently and be able to tell someone, hey, by the way, in four weeks, you're going to go down this dip. And it's very normal. It's very acceptable. Let's not ruminate in it too much. Let's not sit there for too long. There's an upcoming. I just want you to trust the process and lean in. It's very much like um, one of your um, principles. You know, you have a, a dip in momentum or you'll have a dip. And that's where you ask your clients to lean in a little bit more, have a higher degree of accountability. Don't go for that cookie or for that um, piece of sweet that you want to have. Instead, lean in, have an, have an app or switch the, switch the tactic. So it's all about communication. And the great thing is with online physio is um, it, you, have, you can have a constant communication. So if you're on the app, you can almost be talking on a daily basis, which some of the clients will be doing. Mm -hmm. um, some of the clients, when I see they haven't dropped in a message, for me, that's normally a time to say, let me send them a message. So the communication is another aspect. We catch them before they dip into this um, that, that pit hole and feel sorry for themselves. It's funny how close the parallels are to the body transformation journey. Yeah. I think it's all not just uh, body transformation. I think it's any part of life, right? Yeah, like, any, um, any progression. Yeah. Like we've had some crazy stories. So if some person came to see us, uh, she spent 10,000 pounds elsewhere with other therapists and physios and going to get specific treatments done. And, and, and that was it. She was just getting treatments. No one was really finding out what the root cause of the problem was. But what the back pain was actually helping her do was stay connected to her husband because her husband actually gave, um, you know, uh, took care of her, which he wouldn't normally while she was in back pain. Oh, wow. So until we unraveled the whole thing and then sort of, you know, almost did a bit of like a counseling session, even though we're not really qualified to do that. And I kind of go hard to see the lights. All I did is show the light and say, look, all you're doing is actually you're spending. I mean, this is a person who has a gabapentin, uh, which for those who are not listening. And uh, it's like it, it's a per, it's a pain nerve medication where you take a lot of it and it's it's not really good for the body. Uh, and then she's also sipping on morphine. So, you know, like how you and I sip on water, she'll be sipping on morphine. Wow. So uh, in three months, we were able to completely shift this person and, and they're, they're still married and they're very happily married. So, uh, you know, that's a win. And now the connect is where the why, the physio, 
didn't just have to do another treatment. He had to figure out what was going on. And once he figured out what was going on, it's about connecting the two dots and saying, let's now get this person and coach them through the journey. How much do you think pain is psychosomatic? So there's, there's two levels of this. So I think there is a massive psychosomatic element. Uh, pain is a variable of factors, a multitude of factors. So let's just take this lady, for example. Hers was social, uh, family, uh, work. She was uh, sort of not going to work. A lot of it was sort of external factors. But then physiologically, she still had a, a disc issue. She still had um, you know, uh, poor nutrition. She still had uh, chronic inflammation going on. So I think it's part of the thing, but I don't think it's the only thing. So a lot of now people are saying, well, pain is in your head. No, it's not. Actually, there is science to show that there's chronic inflammation. Why, why else would you have things like um, CRP markers that are raised, right? Uh, why else would you have markers that show body inflammation in a chronic state um, being raised if there was nothing physiological going on? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. One thing uh, I think would be good to tell, tell the listeners is before we carry on, what are, what are your credentials personally and how, how did you get into this world of physio? Because it's a... Uh, you're, you're, you're not just um, any old physio. You've really got into the game. You've worked with some of the top professionals in sport uh, and you, you know, you're, the, you're, the, you're the go-to man for many people. Yeah. What is, no, I'm, I'm how did Rushav Savla get into the game? Yeah, so um, funny enough, I was actually meant to be a dentist um, and I was studying uh, for a dental school. Um, did, um, sort of, did, did, my heart wasn't in it. But at the same time, I was dancing. So I was actually a break dancer. I was one of those guys I'd be flipping from building to building, doing backflips and all that stuff. Uh, so it was, it was pretty amazing stuff. And I just love the idea of human movement and what you can push your body through. And um, so there were times where I was doing a backflip once and I was thinking I was doing it sort of 10 to 12 times. And it was a really hot girl walked past and I wanted to kind of like um, show off a little bit. So I did a couple of backflips. And when I landed, um, I actually snapped my ankles clean. Oh, wow. <laughs> and that was, that was literally, yeah. <laughs> so I was a little bit cocky just before I injured myself. And then I was in a wheelchair for a few months. Um, and, and that sort of really laid, um, it really I saw the power and the transformative effect of what um, another human can do for another human. Um, and what pain truly is, you know, I was hooked on tramadol, uh, which is a painkiller that they give you. Now, at the time, it wasn't really heavily regulated. So they'll just give you like 28. Whereas you might only need like seven mm. and I was hooked onto it. And I just started realizing like all the things that people would do to try and sort of stay away from pain. Um, whereas I started sort of going the other way and I started accepting pain and seeing it as almost like a, uh, like a guide map. Like if there's too much pain, I'll calm down whatever I was doing. But if there wasn't enough pain, I'd start doing that. And that sort of drew me into what physio really is. Um, and then I went and studied uh, physio um, in undergrad uh, sort of at St. George's Medical University and then sort of moved through the NHS. Um, and then during the NHS career, I actually dislocated both my shoulders, um, again, from dancing and doing like some uh, tough mothers and all that kind of stuff. Um, and these are chronic problems that I had for a long time. Um, and then it kind of dawned on me how important what I do really is if I can do this journey for myself and I am able to help myself through it, because my physios were crap. Don't get me wrong. My physios are absolutely rubbish. I had no physio that really sticks to my mind and says, you know what? I'm so grateful for this person. Uh, in, in fact, I'm grateful for them showing me the way uh, mm -hmm. of what not to be, of how not to be as a physio. Um, and then pain and performance. And I started working with sort of um, some private clubs. I uh, started working in the private world. Uh, but it was, it was all focusing on the... Um, the next time you come in, have I hit my targets? Have I brought in X amount of revenue? Have I brought in the person uh, six times in six weeks? <clears throat> the focus was not on the person. It was on the, the problem. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that was a big disconnect. So I almost burnt out the career. I actually wanted to do, I was looking at other options. I was looking at like going to like some sort of business um, uh, job just to kind of like move away from this. But uh, what really sort of spurred me on was actually setting up R&D. So it was either that or go to Australia and do a master's in advanced uh, medicine. And I started becoming like a shoulder expert and then just stayed the course and yeah, R&D physio grew and here we are. So your trigger to start R&D was, it almost came, you almost didn't start it essentially. Well, I actually got kicked out of my NHS job because they were like, you're taking too long to come back in. <laughs> oh, wow. 
Yeah. So How long has R&D been uh, alive now in, in the current uh, So in the current uh, world, I think it's going to be um, five, it's going to be five years in July, but mm-hmm. uh, um, it, we lit, for the first year, we didn't do really do much. So technically four years where we, we really went for it. Yeah. And how does the R&D process work? What is the methodology for someone inquiring all the way to um, you actually see them? What, how, how does your process differentiate from others that makes it so powerful in healing? Yeah, I think I think the biggest thing is um, the connection. So the first thing we do is obviously we'll get your details. Either you contact us and we'll get you an appointment booked in. But even prior to the appointment for the online physio, we have like a... Um, a certain criteria that you almost need to sort of um, like a form you need to fill out first of all, which gives us really specific information. Uh, it's almost like knowing is your pain a five or a six? Is your pain sort of dull or sharp? Is your pain um, sort of stopping you from picking up your kids when you're doing bath time? Or is it stopping you from actually like, you know, being intimate with your wife? Like people will put so much detail down. You don't realize because they're willing to be heard because we're the experts. And although we're saying we're the experts, we're also just people on the other side of the room or the other side of the screen. Um, so that's the biggest sort of, uh, you could say our USP is that we connect to the person that's opposite us. But I think more than that, we really find out why they want physiotherapists. Why do they want to spend their time? Why do they want to spend their energy? Why do they want to spend their money with us? And that's in the first consult. And we'll do that through subjective questions that we would never ask you, you know, why do you want physio? Why do you want this? Why do you want that? But through our own sort of deductions, we'll figure out, okay, this is why this person's sort of coming in. Um, and then what we do is we'll give them, a, um, so throughout the consult, we will actually love our hands-on therapy. So if you do get a chance, we will do it. But um, on the online physio side of things, we actually get them to do some self-massage, some self-correction work, um, and also rehab. And then we sort of pinpoint and map their journey in the first consult. So that I don't, my, none of my physios will ever see, let's see how it goes. Yeah. Because that's weak. That's, that's someone saying to you, Akash, uh, we're going to come to you. We're going to pay the money. And then you're going to them like, okay, well, start on your steps and then we'll see how it goes. Yeah. You've almost forgotten the nutrition. You've forgotten everything else that R&T offers. Well, it's not only that. It's the most people come to physios and, and coaches for belief. And yeah. if, if you say to someone, let's see how it goes, there's no belief there, no confidence in what you do. So not, not, uh, if you don't have the confidence, how are they going to have the confidence? Yeah. And then we have a, a process where we almost try and get them back in in that same week, even if it's an online consult. So we'll try and do what we call um, a five and two method where we're trying to get them to see us more frequently. Now, that's not necessarily from a financial gains perspective. Actually, it's for us to make sure that they're keeping on to the adherence. We're picking up any niggles. Things can change in two days. So if I've given you something and I think that it's flared up your pain, you, I'm not going to expect you to sort of wait a week before you contact me again saying, hey, by the way, what you gave me actually messed me up a whole week before um, everything's settled down. I'd want to see them much more earlier on. And then the other thing is we would connect to the coaches. So if they're with RNT, we'd connect straight away on the first appointment with um, Elliot, with Nathan, with Shanita and say, look, um, so-and-so have come in. This is what their plan looks like. I'm taking this, 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 uh, and changing it with this, this, this. But the goal is to return them back to that exercise. For example, someone might come in and be doing like, well, I can't really do a single leg squat. So we will change something. Or we, I can't do a lunge, for example. It hurts when I lunge. We will change that up to something different. And then we'll say this is the time frame to return back to that lunge. So it's not about who's right. It's about what's best for this person. And let's work as a collective rather than saying, I'm the physio you're just a personal trainer. Yeah. You're just a coach. Um, and then the other thing is having respect for that person. So the respect bit um, is firmly sort of in our core values. And it's about being transparent and honest and saying, look, I don't think this is changing. And if it's not changing, let's signpost you to experts. So for example, someone's shoulder's not improved in three months. You're going to go and see a shoulder specialist. I don't want to leave you hanging. I don't want to say to you, okay, sorry, unfortunately nothing works. And then you sort of go away, go back to your life and just say, well, my shoulder's like this. I'm going to live like this for the rest of my life. Um, the whole process is very streamlined in that it we know exactly where we are and the client knows exactly where they are. And we hold them accountable and they hold us accountable. Mm. And, and, and the idea to have this whole um, connectivity uh, almost improves our relationship. 
we we end up leading as friends and that's not how we started when you start medical school they always tell you try not to become friends with your patients try not to become um, pals with people um, and d don't do any of that uh, i think communication is our usp amazing and on the topic of um working with coaches and, and seeing a lot of uh, people who are, who take their training very seriously, they're looking to transform their body. What are some of the most common issues you see uh, in those who, who are training hard, whether it's the regular gym folk or those who are taking it very seriously and have structured programs? Yeah, I think the, stru the structured programs, they're great. These guys are like looking for that 1%. They're the progressive mindset. They're the, the, the guys like you who walk around with a training log in the gym. Yeah. yeah, those are the guys we love um, because we would hardly see them. But when we do see them, it's because they've followed that same rule where they've done too much, too fast, too soon. So that's with any injury. Most musculoskeletal injuries would be something too much, something too fast, or something that's um, too soon. For example, someone um, who we're currently seeing jump from a 25 to 25 kg incline dumbbell press, and they moved up to uh, 27 um, and for most of us, we would think, actually, you know what, that's, that's okay. That's, that's acceptable. But they went ahead and did the same amount of reps or they did the same amount um, and the same tempo as well. That in itself probably triggered something. Now, um, the frustration here is that this person was progressing, 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 and then they hit a roadblock. Yeah. That roadblock is that their shoulders are not designed to go any heavier um, or they haven't prepped their shoulder enough, or they haven't built that rotator cuff stability, they haven't built that proprioception in the shoulders to get over to the next stage. Um, and for a lot of the guys, their strength gains will go so rapidly, right? Like some of the guys who start, for example, they'll improve quite rapidly. Um, but then what the problem is, they're excited on that journey and they won't use the rule of 10%. So I always say 10% or even just progressive overload, use that 1.25 plate a little plate that sits in the gym that most blokes do not know how to use because they see it as a sign of weakness, right? Yeah. Uh, and I think the most common in injuries where we would see uh, for, for some of these uh, training guys, the guys who had their training logs and stuff, are uh, things like shoulders. Every other part of the body may improve quite rapidly, but shoulders is a, a big common one. And, and most of the ones who are training heavy do pick up injury. You're on a borderline. You're on a borderline of pain and performance. Yeah. And and every now and then, it's okay to go into the pain side of things. It's just to humble you. It's just to tell you, actually, you've got prep work to be done before you go back into performance space. But it's not that I'm going to be this and this is it. I've seen people like yourselves leave the gym. And that, to me, is a failure, not on the person, but on the physio who is helping them or the health professional who's helping them. Yeah. I've a... Uh... I've always thought if you train hard and you train progressively and you rack up the years, your injuries are going to accumulate just by default. And it's because you keep crossing that barrier of, okay, if I go from 48 to 50 kilos, one muscle in my body may not be ready for those 50 kilos, but because of that one muscle, everything else breaks yeah. down. And I'm assuming that's what you mean by every barrier that you, to get over to the next, but get to the next level, you need to prep your body, whether yeah. it's one muscle or five muscles yeah. You don't do that. And that's yeah. where the, the conundrum of pain and performance comes into play. And potentially why physio is not only reactive, but proactive as well. That's it. So I was just going to come on to that. It would be someone like you would want to come and see a physio and discuss this during your, or you know, join up an online consult and say, actually, look, these are my pain points. And I know I feel weak around here. A niggle is just sometimes, um, it's a warning. What is pain? Pain is a warning. It's a warning system designed by our body saying, hey, buddy, watch out. Or, hey, buddy, have, have a think about this one. And it's the same thing with your shoulder. Now, I don't necessarily buy into the whole one muscle, five muscles thing because mm -hmm. I feel our body is so complex. We're still figuring out what actually is happening. And literally, research is still figuring out what happens. Really? I know that there are things you can do to bulletproof your shoulders, for example, for this person. There are rehab drills that you can use and progressively use them as training. When I give people rehab, I almost say to them, use this like you train. Like if you're going to be putting your blinkers on, listen to some Tupac, your rehab can be part of this. And I mean, most people would laugh at me, but your rehab is actually meant to be intense. 
Now, I'm not saying go mad at your rehab and like start like going crazy, but actually use that. I'll take it sniffing salts before rehab sessions. Yeah. <laughs> sniffing salts before rehab. Uh, that'd be a first. But uh, yeah, there are people who will be surprised. There are guys in the gym who you could probably see and you'd be like, wow, these guys are tough. Get them to do a push up or get them to do um, a certain movement that involves one arm movements, for example. And all of a sudden, they're unable to put their body weight through it. Um, I've got a three kilo dumbbell here. Um, some blokes will be unavailable to sort of uh, even just be able to do a specific movement with the three kilos, but they're happy to be lifting lateral raise for 12 kilos at a time. So, so it's about bulletproofing your shoulder, about understanding it, and also about in, understanding the whole relationship between pain and performance. And it's acceptable to be injured. Don't, don't put yourself in a box where I'm injured so I can't train. Um, and, and, and these are the guys who we would love to see because when they stop training at their peak, they see it as a sign of big weakness. So they see it as a sign, so most of them anyway, uh, see it as a sign of um, they've done something wrong. Uh, you know, it's going to be like this forever. They start losing. That log goes missing. They become de- demotivated. And all of a sudden, it's just a spiral. Can you speak about that a bit more in, in that we hear often, uh, I'm injured now, so I can't train. I can't do anything. But we, my answer has always been, there's always something you can do and you can always work around it and you can focus on what you can control. Yep. But speak to them as a, as a physio. What, what is the professional opinion here? Uh, I, th- I, I, I totally think you're right. I think you, um, as a health coach, I think the, the one thing you've nailed here is movement is medicine. So any type of movement is good for you. For example, someone comes into my clinic with acute lack, l- lower back pain, that back pain that makes you want to scream with every movement I gave the guy bicep curls and I tricked his brain to allow him to just breathe and relax. All I gave the guy was bicep curls for his lower back pain. And it automatically got his back pain moving. It automatically got him sort of getting a lot more relaxed, settled his shoulders down, focused on his breathing, got him into that better mindset. When he left, we didn't even touch the back, but his back felt 10 times better than if I'd just gone and just done hands-on treatment, this and that, the other. Um, So for these people, what I would say to them is, no, you're injured is not an excuse. It's not an excuse, but it is an excuse to get connected with someone who can help. Um, It's an excuse to be accountable to your coach for all the other areas. And don't let the injury um, start affecting things like your steps things like well you know um things like your nutrition things like your hydration things like your mindset um and just have a look before that injury happened uh, and this is where man meat um sort of has come into it and i think you've had her on a couple of podcasts before um and i've done a couple of courses with her and she was this uh, uses this rule where you almost become a little bit cocky before your injury and um th- there is a science behind this as well really but, I think, there, yeah, there is definitely science behind this, but there's also that sort of uh, feeling of going, like for a sprinter, you think Usain Bolt thinks he is uh, the baddest one on the planet? He probably does. But when he starts running, he's relaxed. Most people, when we start doing like, okay, I'm psyched to bench press this 50 kilos. I'm psyched. I'm super pumped. I'm super humbled. I'm like, I mean, not humbled. I'm super sort of going to go for it. That's when they go and injure themselves crazy because you know when i before i hurt my shoulder recently i was i was telling everyone i'm in the best training period of my life yeah, yeah. for years yeah. like this is the best run i'm on like i'm i'm heading into all-time territory at, at half at 10 kilos less body weight yeah this is just this is the best is going two yeah. weeks later i'm out of commission <laughs> yeah 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 and how many months before did we speak about your shoulder uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the thing. These are injuries that will sort of plague you for life. Like I'm at shoulder yeah. surgeries and you have pain. Pain is part of life. So for, for the listeners, uh, Rushab and I, we delivered a seminar in Nairobi in, back in the uh, end of October. And it was called the Bulletproof uh, Body Transformation Seminar. One day it was about body transformation and one day it was about uh, staying bulletproof. And he used me as a demo for multiple different uh, shoulder um, shoulder exercises and uh, demonstrations. And uh, he knows I have a clicky shoulder and, the, and there's certain pain I get. And uh, he asked me to do this rehab and said, like, I need to look at your shoulder when, you, when we get back to London. And I was like, yeah, it'll be fine. Like this, I can still press and I can still press heavy. And then just gradually over the course of the weeks, I just felt a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then around Christmas time, I was starting to feel it even more. And then it got to January. And Rushab kept saying, when are we going to come see you? I'm like, yeah, soon, soon. 
And then I like, start of, I think it was the end of Feb. I just sent him like a five minute voice note. Rush, I've, I've completely messed up. I can't, I can't do anything. I can't even move my shoulder. I can't even move my arm up. Um, so, uh, before lockdown. So it's like, wow, this is going to be uh, uh, interesting. So yeah, I think, I think the key here, the message here, even just from your own experience is the signposting is the biggest thing. If you talk to your coach, they'll be able to signpost you. Mm-hmm. If you um, talk to us, we'll be able to signpost you back to your coach because the idea is that we're here to help you through your journey. So we're here to guide you through that journey and we're here to sort of accelerate that journey in every possible hack that we have in our arsenal. Now, if I can give you three hacks and say to you, go smash a shoulder workout, but before that, go and smash this hacks, you're more likely to link the two up and you're more likely to sort of less, uh, be less injured. And again, going back to what you just said, it's about getting yourself um, looked at um, from a holistic point of view. I mean, how much, how much does it suck not being able to bend for us? Uh, it's, yeah, it sucks. Yeah. 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 I mean, of course it sucks. Like it's, uh, and it's I guess there's only one body part I can't train, which is my chest. But it's uh, for me, it doesn't feel like an upper body workout complete. Yeah, there you go. That, that's the key. Yeah, and you're a creature of routine. You're a creature of habit. For you, yeah, yeah, yeah. having a workout and not having a bench press or a chest movement exercise in it, and instead doing band work, doesn't cut it, mate. Right. The crazy thing is, I moved to a new gym, and I got there, and the first thing I was looking at is like, do they have what? What is the, What do the dumbbells go up to? I get there, and I'm, the dumbbells go up to sixty. Right. Right. Firstly, it's brilliant. But also the better thing is in my previous gym, it went from 50 kilos to 55. Mm-hmm. So there was always a big jump. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I could, I could get 55 for a couple of reps, but it wasn't worth doing a proper set on. But now they had the 50, 52, 54, 56. And I was getting so excited. Okay. I was like, this is, this is perfect. I haven't actually been able to use them. Yeah. Uh, you know what? That will change. But now you've got the perfect time period. Although we're in a lockdown, I'm saying to people, this is the perfect time yeah. to iron out your issues. This is the perfect time to, one, get in touch. Two, make sure um, that you've got a plan in place. Um, and, and don't just get in touch with a physio. Um, get in touch with a health coach like yourselves. Get in touch with a mindset coach. Get in touch with being able to sort of help your own self. This three months is almost like a gift from like the universe saying, hey, by the way, or three or four months, whatever. Use this time for your own personal improvements. Whether it's, I want to sleep more. I want to help my you know, family more. I want to be able to do more things. And it's a, it's a scary thing out there that most people are going through. Like, let me not paint the picture sort of, you know, all beauty and pretty for, per- perfect. But the key here is you're still in control. Yeah, you choose to be. So, Rushab, let's uh, let's let's do an exercise here, and yep. I want you to take the listeners through some movement screens or yep. potential uh, drills that they can work on as a diagnostic tool. Because I'm cool. sure everyone everyone listening is into training. Okay, yep. um, they've all probably got some sort of niggle. Everyone yep. everyone's got a niggle in some in some form. Okay. Uh, Let's go through the most common ones you see. So I'm assuming right. we'll, start, knee. We'll, we'll start with shoulder first then. So let's just think, sort of, imagine you're not looking at me and, and I'm, and I'll, just, I'll move my, I've, I've put, I've minimized you okay. as beautiful as you are. I've minim- I'll put you <laughs> uh, so I'm going to go for a shoulder screen. So say if you're just standing and you're facing the mirror, I want you to get your hands by your sides and you're going to go sideways all the way to the top until your thumbs touch each other. Now, during that movement, try to do five or six reps and let me know if you feel any restriction, any discomfort, any sort of uh, irritation. Okay. If you do. To recap, sorry, you're going to hands by your sides and you're moving them up towards the shoulder. Exactly. All the way up, uh, up to the top of the shoulder and then bring you back down. Okay. Yeah. We call this abduction um, or people would call it lateral raise. Imagine you're doing a lateral raise, but you're going all the way up instead of just uh, going down again, these are with no weights, right? Yeah. Uh, the second movement I want you to do is I want you to do a flexion movement. So I want you to go above your head. So going straight, imagine you're going to shake someone's hand, but you're going all the way to the top and then you bring it back down. Okay. Now if you feel any niggles or if you feel any sort of, um, just make a note of it. All you have to do is literally write zero or one. If there was some discomfort, it's a zero. Even if it's the slightest amount of discomfort, uh, it's a one, sorry. Um, so if there, any discomfort is a one, any, uh, sort of it was clear, it's a zero. The second thing we're going to do is imagine you're doing what we call external rotation. So arms out abducted, which is into that lateral raised position. Then I want you to imagine your fingers have to go towards the ceiling, but your elbow stays where it was. So this is a, a, a one movement that most people are horrible at. 
uh, and, and I use that word um, horrible because they can't do this, but what they're trying to do with their shoulders is by bench pressing heavy, by creating all sorts of forces going through that shoulder joint. Um, and the last exercise I want you to do is, again, make sure you put that one or zero, is hand behind back. Are they the same? Do they feel the same? Okay. And once you've done that, you can sort of score yourself out of 10. Now, most uh, out of four, sorry, most people will probably be able to get a two out of four. So you're only as good as 50% of the range in your shoulder. So Rusha, are we, does a one mean no pain or does one mean? No, one mean, one means discomfort, pain, whatever you want to call it. So okay. one, is, one is something. Or it means you can't actually do the range. Yeah. Or you can't do the range or something's not right. One feels different to the other. Okay. And okay. a good score is a good score. I'm assuming is four. It has to be four. It has to be four. Yeah. Like let's not let's not. Um, you know, if if your listeners and anyone who's listening who wants to train and wants to train pain free and effectively, or you have to be a four. Okay. And now let's dive into each of those deeper. Mm -hmm. What would be some? Uh, and this is again, it's very difficult to generalize, but I'm sure you have some things yeah. you always see. If someone is is reporting pain in the flexion, so the first one where you're you're standing on your yeah. hands by your sides, so and a lot of times, yeah, a lot of times we think the long head of biceps is at play here. So most of us sit with the forward head of position of our shoulder. Now, some critics and some physios will say, well, posture doesn't matter. I do believe posture has a place to play in every injury, but I don't think it's the most important. Now, for some people, that's probably more of like a long head of biceps injury where their shoulder is just sitting a little bit more forward than I would like when they train. So for that, I would give them rehab and I would get them to sort of work on their rotator cuff or I'd get them to sort of think about retraction of the shoulder blades. Um, most of the people that I have seen in the gym have a fundamental flaw in any scapular exercises or scapular mobility or understanding the relationship between the scapula and the shoulder, for example. I wouldn't say there's a big, big relationship. There's too much focus on it. But I would say you need to be able to learn how to scoop the shoulder blade. Okay. Do you, do, shall, I, shall I explain to you in simple terms what yeah, that means? I don't know what you mean by that. Okay. So scooping of the shoulder blade is, imagine you're doing a pull-up. Yeah. But what I've asked you to do is I've asked you to scoop your shoulders towards each other and down towards your back pocket. Okay. So, so like the up. initiation of the movement, the That's exactly compression. Right. That's exactly right. So you're basically retracting your shoulder blades, so pulling them back. You're bringing them uh, towards each other and you bring them down towards your back pocket. Got your it. Jeans. So shoulders back and down, yeah. Back and down. Now that's the movement. Now most people struggle with it. I mean, we've had technique workshops and people who've been sort of um, so-called um, veterans or experts, even they struggle with it. Yeah. Okay, so that's the one movement. The second movement is a push-up. I want you to do a complete push-up and I want you to tell me whether you get pain or not. Okay, so again, it's giving me a score out of zero and one. And the third movement I like doing is the overhead press. So I just want you to get into that overhead press position, do it with no weights. I just want you to go up and down and tell me what you feel. Okay, so this is more of a subjective question. This is where I get people to just report to me, oh, my left feels a bit weird, my right feels a bit weird. And you, the, people say to us, yeah, it feels weird. And I look at it and I say, actually, don't worry about it. It's fine. Yeah. So, so that's just your shoulder. <laughs> Um, let's move. Are you, are you happy with the shoulder? Yeah. So to recap, you've got the four different tests. Uh, and then based on that, there's three different exercises, which can help you. Yep. Three or four exercises, which can help you um, sleeping, push up and overhead press, but are they, di are they further diagnostics or are they actually, they're not the rehab. So there are further diagnostics as well, but I think they can be used as rehab. Okay. So a lot of this is like, it's a mixture. So it's never one size fit all fits all. It's more like, and um, let's try this and let's see how irritable your shoulder gets. Yeah. Okay. Can we maintain the irritability levels? Yes, we can. Um, for everyone listening here, um, I'm going to talk about pain and the last little bit of section today, but it's, it's going to be interesting if you hang on. Um, in terms of um, the wrist mobility, all I want to see is a flexion extension. So can you cock your wrist up? Can you bend it down? Do they look the same on both sides? And can you do a push-up hold position? So can you hold your wrist in a push-up position? Cool. The second thing I would get them to do um, is normally a squat and just feel where you feel the restriction when you squat, you know, and you don't have to go all the way down. Uh, so that's a bit of a myth about the whole ass to grass. Most blokes in the gym want to go down there. Unfortunately, if you're sitting for long periods of time in your gym, uh, in your chair, it will be a, a, a one that you have to sort of master. So what I'd look for here is what feels tight, what feels restricted. Does it hurt? 
um, and that's about it. Okay. Uh, and then the, the more important one is I'm just going to look at your single leg squat. So it's like doing a knee dip where you stand on one leg and you're going to get, um, you, you're going to knee, uh, sorry, you've got to just dip. Um, so left leg, for example, left knee going over. Now I'm looking for three or four things here. I'm looking for what's happening at your foot. Can you even hold your body weight and can you even balance? Most people will say, oh, I've got shit balance. Um, excuse the French. Uh, but I would say, no, you just haven't trained it well. Um, every joint in our body has what we call mechanoreceptors, which are like a car parking sensor. Have you got one of those cars that's got a parking sensor? Have you been in one of those cars that's got a yeah. parking sensor? Yeah. It will tell you how far away from a wall you are. I say the same thing with these things, but these receptors will tell you how far you are away from actually tipping over. For example, your ankle. It will tell your brain, fire, fire, fire this muscle or these muscle groups, and you'll be able to correct yourself again. And I think with a single leg squat, we look for, is my knee dipping inwards? So is my knee going towards the other knee? Am I able to hold my trunk? Am I able to have good balance when I do this? And that's the simple thing, three things that I look at. And that can tell me a lot about your core, about mm. your hip strength, about your knee uh, mobility, and about you as a person. Can you even connect to your ankle? Most of us have forgotten how to connect to each part of our body. And, and then the, the other thing I'd do is lunge. So I'd see what a lunge looks like. Uh, I've seen some horrific lunges and I've seen some, so I've seen some really good lunges. Uh, so I always look at that and I, again, review it. What you're looking for is that 90-90 rule for most lunges where the knee can bend at 90 and the back knee stays at 90 as well. For some of us who are advanced, you can actually throw your knee a lot more forward. Um, and some people will email and say, well, you know, I've heard that knee going over your toes is a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, so I think we've got to definitely clear that one up. That's definitely not good. Go uh, you know, it's, it's actually how your knees meant to work. Uh, try sit up with your knees straight. Like try sit up at 90 degrees and try stand with your knees not going past your toes before you stand. Try climb the stairs without your knee going past your toes. Try and... Uh, Get up from the toilet without your knees going past your toes. Try pick up something off the floor without your knees going past your toes. Myth debusted. Yeah. Right. It's, uh, yeah. I think for most people, it highlights, if they get pain from that, doesn't it highlight that they're just very weak in their VMOs and mm -hmm. in the actual quad? I'm going, to another, I'm going to quash another myth. There's nothing about like a VMO. There's enough studies done to show whether the activation of the VMO really helps the kneecap or not. Or there you go, you're busting my own myths. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's sorry, mate. Um, there's nothing Good. like a, a specific muscle controlling a specific um, movement. It's more as a collective. Are they robust enough to take your load through that position or through that movement? And so, yeah, I, I would say, you know, all it, all pain is telling you is let's just get strong a little bit or let's just see what we're doing and let's modify it. Let's regress it a little bit before we progress it. Okay. So what I'm taking, what I've taken from this is if you're, if you're showing symptoms of pain, the first thing to do is run through all these diagnostics mm -hmm. to, sh to give you an idea of a little bit closer to what may be causing it. But after that, it's too individual and it's too much beyond our own subjectivity and our own scope to be able to do this without professionals. So that's where, that's where you come in. But for yeah. anyone listening to this podcast, the, the basic diagnostics you can run through if you're feeling pain in area, any area would be the shoulder four-way, uh, the four-way shoulder test, the wrist extend, extension and flexion, yep. the wrist push-up, uh, the squat, the lunge, and the single leg dip. Are yep. they the, the key ones, yeah? So we'll put they're that in the, the show ones. notes. Yeah, they're the key ones. I think we've got a couple of others that we use for our own movement screen, which is the online Plus. version. Um, and that one of them I would like to add here is a spinal flexibility, which is um, a forward bend, a backward bend. So it's you standing, and I want you to bend it forward, uh, and I want you to bend backwards, and I want you to rotate sideways. So I want you to bend sideways, and I just want you to twist your spine. Just standing there, I want you to turn around like someone's called you from behind, but your hips are still facing forward. Okay, so all you're looking over here is again, how is that spine? Is there a niggle? Do we feel tightness? Tightness is a, a, a sensation. It's not an injury. It's not something that you should go and get massage done for all the time. It feels nice. Don't get me wrong. I love something that somebody, if someone says to me, I feel tight and I do a quick release. And I can do anything. There's been times when I've used a spoon. Have you seen those videos where you see people scraping with different tools and stuff like yeah. that? Yeah. 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 Yeah, I use your spoon. 
I use a spoon, like literally the same thing. Now these kits are sold at 200, 300 pounds a yeah. blade. I use a, I use a proper stainless steel spoon and it does the same job. Okay. All I've done is just given that guy that interruption to his pain mm. and he felt great. He's walked out of my clinic feeling amazing. Yeah. You got those he, Buffalo scrapers or all sorts, right? There's, I've seen them as well. They were a big thing a couple of days, a couple of years ago. They were like three, 400 quid a pop. There's a Theragun now. The Theragun's now come into play. So what's the deal with Theragun? Is it, is it, yeah. how are you not looking at the other day? Yeah, I know. And it's, it's great. It's like a great percussion tool. And all it is is someone just vibrating uh, that massage uh, into that sort of muscle, sorry. And all you're doing is basically creating blood flow. So going back to my tightness thing, if I introduce blood flow back into that tightness area, your nerves are going to get nourished. The muscles are going to get nourished. The pains are going to sort of go away temporarily. All of a sudden, you just used your tightness and you've thrown all these passive treatments in it and you've got it temporarily better. But if I got you stronger, you naturally get blood flow to it. You naturally get the nerves innovated. You naturally start sending pain signals down. For example, your shoulder. I gave you specific exercises that require your tendon to go through um, isometric exercises. This is basically like paracetamol type exercises for your tendon. And I got you to go to a three out of 10 pain or four out of 10 pain. And I said, don't push that threshold, but definitely get to it. What you're doing here is you're modulating the pain in your body or the level of pain in your body. And these are for all the chronic lifters in the gym, anyone with gym injuries or anyone with even acute injury. I'll just say to you, just do that tendon exercise, make sure it's working and tell me what that tightness sensation, that pain sensation, and what happens to it. And if you do it the right amount and the right way, you're bound to have reduction in pain, which will allow you to work towards performance. Interesting. So you're saying embrace the pain in order to get to performance, but only <laughs> a certain level of pain, because that's what your tendons need in order to actually recover. Yeah, I think a four out of 10 pain, uh, five out of 10 pain, I think, for some uh, of us who love pain, I think it's good enough. Um, and just don't don't try and read too much about it. It's your body. You're working out. Like some of the guys who are going to start RNT, for example, you've been desk bound, unhealthy. You had um, things in your life that stopped you from going for your ideal um, lifestyle. And you're changing things very rapidly. In three months, you're loading, you're shifting, you're walking, you're nutrition, you're hydrating. Your body's about to give you a wake-up call and say, oh, no, 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 all these years, you've done it this way. Now you're throwing this three, three months or six months or one year of um, all this stuff. Give me a time to adjust. Give me a time to sort of, you know, get my tendon to change structure. Get, let me throw more collagen on the area. Let me sort of adapt. Um, and, and let yourself, let your body adapt to like, let your body adapt to a bit of pain. Let your body actually, you know, why I said someone is when they're in pain, I say, look for three, four weeks, just do a little bit of movement, keep going and then book yourself in if things are not improving. You know, if you do the things right way, which is too much, too fast, too soon, look where the problem was, take that problem out, then say to yourself, actually, I took the problem out and I readjusted it and I'm still not getting any better. Get in touch. How can people be more proactive with their physio and, and uh, pain and performance management? Um, you know where everyone goes for an MOT for their uh, cars and their dentists and their pharmacists or you know, go and pick up my prescriptions. You can do the same with physios. There's no reason why you can't go to see a physio even though you're not in pain. And that's the preventative side of things. I'll, in the nicest way possible, I don't want you to see you in my clinic. I want to see you go and live your life or your best version of your life or however cliche that sounds, it's exactly what R&D stands for. Um, so people could come in like quarterly, people could come in um, or even have a movement screen online and say to them, this is a program I'm setting us up. Let's communicate. Let's just send emails every quarter or every month or every two months. And we have a service that's already in built and ready for that. So it's about you creating a, a relationship with someone on the other side who understands you and understands your goals and also understands how you want to get there and then guides you. And that's what we do at R&D, just guide you. Amazing. I want to uh, bust a few myths. Before we go into my shoulder, I want to bust a few myths here. Yeah, go uh, for it. What, and you touched on it earlier. What is the deal with posture? Because there's some people that say posture is everything and there's others who say it doesn't matter. What is the deal with it? And how important is it to have good posture, whatever that may mean? Yeah. 
I think it's um, everyone's working from home right now, right? Yeah. And if you weren't working from home and now you have, all of a sudden you're going to be having niggles, aches, back pains, and all that stuff. It's actually the time spent being in a posture. So me hunched over like that has actually caused me to have a bit of upper trap issues. But as soon as I go downstairs, pick up two kettlebells and just do some shrugs, that pain has gone away. It's not about posture. It's the time spent in these postures. If I was crouching all day long and I spent my um, whole day crouching and sort of, I would have some discomfort when I try and get standing and get moving again. Um, if everyone does an exercise where they hold a fist, tense it as hard as you can, try and maintain that for 24 hours now. Of course, you're going to be in some level of discomfort. And a lot of us, unfortunately, are doing that by spending too much time in one posture. I would say there is some uh, areas where posture does matter. For, for me, shoulders are a big thing. Uh, body, just the way you stand, is a big thing. Um, and it's about connecting the dots. Like if someone tells you and tells you, hey, by the way, you've got crap posture, but doesn't tell you everything else about it and why it's going to affect you and how it's already affecting you. Um, and some people just use it as a way to kind of like get people in their clinics. For example, uh, you've got knee pain. I think it's down to your ankle and the way your hips sit and the way your spine is aligned and this and that, the other. I don't buy into that. I don't buy into that. Have you, have, were you there and did you see how his posture was when his knee was injured? You know, try and see it as a collective. It might be a place where we can focus on. If you want to aesthetically look better and have a broader shoulder, we know from research that if I get you to do work on your back a little bit more, you'll naturally start pulling your shoulders a bit back. That way your chest will show a little bit more. Um, for people who go to uh, get passive treatments all the time, these are the guys who stay on stage. Like you went, you competed, right? Yeah. Okay. What are the, some of the criteria they would say to you as was posture a big part of it? Symmetry and presentation laws. Yeah. There you are. But that's because you're a bodybuilder. Yeah. Now, if I'm just, you know, going to my, uh, going, coming home, lifting, training, doing everything else, but really, you know, I have a shoot maybe or something like that. But apart from that, no one else is judging me from the way my posture or symmetry is. Does mm -hmm. it really matter? Why are we spending so much more time talking about posture? Why don't we talk about other things that matter, which is what can I do with that posture? What can I do with um, improving my flexibility? What can I do with improving my strength? Um, and, and the whole posture thing, there's a big debate going on in the physio world as well, where some people think it's the end all and be all. Some people think, well, it is what it is. Let's just move forward. What about the next one? Uh, you just touched on it. Flexibility. Oh, I love flexibility. Uh, Ivan, Ivan, as you call him. Um, I, think, I think there needs to be his version and there needs to be another version. So for those who don't know, Ivan is like this guru of flexibility. Uh, he's an RT coach himself, but he's also uh, freak, right? a freak, a freak of nature. But I, I love it. I think you can see the gymnast in him always comes out. And he's a perfect breed. If I was, my personal goal would be to be as mobile as him, as flexible as him, but as strong as him as well at the same time. Mm. I think his strength parallels um, and flexibility parallels goes to show you that being a bit more flexible isn't a bad thing. Uh, in fact, it enhances performance. The one thing he always says, uh, he actually said on his podcast, was that strength is one of the key drivers for flexibility. Yes, yes. If you want to improve flexibility, make sure you do it through a loaded flexible um, a fle flexibility posture or put some load through things. If you want to, like I'll have a 50 or 60 year old guy coming with knee pain. All I'm doing is making him flexible by doing strength work, though. Yeah. With strength and flexibility, they don't say as separate entities. Everything's all combined. It's literally uh, Akash Vagela's dad's chicken curry, all the different spices added together in one space. <laughs> yeah. So it's not, it's not a case of rolling around on a foam roller, then? What's the deal with those? I, I think they give you what we call a trickster traffic effect. It's basically an effect where you're increasing yeah, the tightness. It's the same thing. You're just increasing blood flow to the area for temporarily. Okay. You know, nice. Don't get rid of it. Um, but don't think that's the way to get my flexibility better. Um, speak to Ivan, uh, look up spinal, uh, look up, just look up people who are good at flexibility routines. And, and I think you guys have got some great content out there on flexibility. So people should just stay tuned for more videos and we'll be putting out some videos for you guys as well. What about, um, sitting on standing desks? Oh, I love standing desks. I regret not buying one um, because now I'm sitting down. But again, you know, 
you know, are we are we that glued to um, a laptop that we are not able to just go outside and enjoy this beautiful sunshine for five minutes? Are we not able to just drop downstairs and to go for a walk or go for like a minute walk and then come back? Well, we, are, we are right now. Yeah, <laughs> we are. Exactly well, we're right now. But, we're on a load right now. But, <laughs> uh, but yes, I think, yeah. I, I think they're great. I think they're great, but I think they're sold at ridiculous prices because I just checked, looked out for one right now. I I'll, think, also, yeah. I'll send you a link. Um, so I got, I got, I got the, the standing bit separate to the, the top tabletop. Okay. And uh, it was reasonably priced, about 200 pounds. So... Yeah, I mean, it's still, it's not cheap, not cheap by any yeah. means, but it is, it is good to vary your day. I think it is, it is, and I think for those who are very good in product, big on productivity and have productivity as a as part of their lifestyle, for example, you, I think it's a phenomenal um, thing to be having. At the same time, don't just say just because I bought a standing desk. I mean, I have guys who have standing desks and still got back problems or still got like issues. So it's not the answer. It's something that if you think you will need it and you're going to use it. It's like a foam roller. It just sits there half the time. Yeah. Well, that's what I've realized. So I only, I, I intersperse it with sitting because I think, like you said earlier, if I only stand, then I start getting pain in my knees and I, it just feels uncomfortable. Whereas the, the finding the balance is, is probably the best thing. And do what suits you. Do what suits you. Don't do it just because Akash does it. Don't do it because don't do Russia said, oh, go and buy a standing desk. Yeah, yeah. Do what suits your lifestyle and what you want out of it. What about uh, yoga? Oh, I love it. If if there was um, any bodybuilder or weight trainer in the gym or newbie, I would say to them, go and get yourself hooked up with a, a virtual yoga at the moment. But even when this passes, go and, go and put a yoga class into your lifestyle. Um, it's not just the physical stuff. I think, you know, most people think of yoga as a physical stuff. Um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm quite into my spiritual way of life. And yoga, if you look back and look at the history of it, it's actually ways and tools to help not just with your whole physical approach, uh, but illnesses, things that help your mindset, things that help you stay in that optimum um, lifestyle. And, and, and if you're really keen, I'm more than happy to share some of the stuff that I've learned over the years. But the, yeah, definitely put it as part of your, your thing, um, your, your routine. Okay, and, and, and to what level? Uh, is this something that someone can do like once a week for 20 minutes or does it need to be done on a more regular basis? I think daily. I think if you're really looking at yoga um, uh, from, the, from the essence, the true essence of yoga, um, it, it's lifestyle. It's like drinking water. So do it if you're going to do it that seriously. If you just want to do it for the mobility and stuff, just choose a flexibility routine. Don't confuse it with yoga. Okay, so yoga is more for uh, spiritual and mental benefits, you feel? It's for everything. It's a lifestyle change. That in itself is a lifestyle change. And I think um, the world has made too much money on yoga mats and all this stuff and, and yoga in itself. And we Westerners have always moved away from what true yoga was intended for. Uh, and it's not a bash between who's better, who's right, who's wrong. It's just, you know, the spinal flexibility or kind of like a, a hip flexibility or a shoulder flexibility routine can serve you just as well. So you don't necessarily need to say, oh, I'm doing yoga. You're doing something. Just just call it, call it that. Last one, uh, last potential myth or topic to uh, validate. What about, you know, when, we, when you see people stretching and they pull their, their anchor up to stretch their quad out or they cross their arm and cross their chest to stretch their shoulder. Is there any validity in that or are they wasting their time? Um, so unless you're doing it for things like 30 seconds, um, uh, it's pointless. And even if you are doing it for 30 seconds, it's the immediate effect. And that's the only one that lasts 20 minutes. Like I haven't said it as well. And like you said it earlier, it's more about the loaded flexibility that we're after. So doing that kind of stuff makes you feel good. Does it help your lifts and performance? Nah. So the real key is getting good at split squats, getting good at RDLs. Perfect. And all similar exercises, training in a, in a, in a full range of motion to yeah. whatever you can do uh, effectively. Yeah. Under control is the best. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And use flexibility and range as a marker as well as not just strength. Oh, I've lifted. Um, you were quick to point it out one time when I sent you my split videos, split squat videos. I was using 30s, I think, and or, and I was doing split squats and I was doing six reps, but I was going maybe three quarters of the way. And you said it yourself, actually, no, you need to go all the way down. So use range as a marker as well, not just I'm going to do it about my form or my range isn't as good as it should be. Is there a case of uh, working in the range you can do so safely versus working in what's perceived as full range of motion? Yes. So it's about what your body allows you to do, right? If I'm, I'm not going to go 
today and do an Ivan split or my body can't handle it. I'll probably be in agony for days. Yeah. Let me progressively overload in a stretching program. And I think progressive overload is applicable to every part of your life, not physically, but mentally as well. So this is part of it. The flexibility part of it, the range part of it is all progressive overload. Absolutely. I get people ask me all the time, should I be going as low as you do on RDLs? I'm like, no, don't do that. <laughs> I remember when we trained, do you remember that? And I was like, yeah. we were struggling in that gym in Kenya. It was a brand spanking new gym, but I think the setup of the gym couldn't allow you to do your full range. Yeah, I just couldn't get low enough. <laughs> but and I was happy. I was happy. I was perfectly fine. That was perfect for me. But I get asked all the time, like I tried to do your range and I couldn't do it. I was like, I'm glad, don't do it because you're going to yeah. hurt yourself. That's exactly right. I think, and the thing is, they see you as a benchmark, whereas they need to stop seeing that. They need to see themselves as a benchmark mm -hmm. and get in touch with a physio or get in touch with someone like a coach who will tell you, you know, the videos that you send to your coach. They are so crucial because they will tell your coach whether you've got the ability to do something like an RDL up to Akash's um, <laughs> or not. <laughs> Absolutely. To, uh, to finish off this podcast, I want you to run yeah. me, I want, us, I want you to take the listeners through what it's like to go through an online physio console. Yeah. Uh, because for many people, it's very, very foreign. I, yeah. I think physio, online coaching in, in a transformational body composition view is now starting to be seen as accepted. Whereas physio, the first thing you think of is the physio bed, you're getting your shoulder rubbed down and then you might get a couple of exercises with a little pink uh, dumbbell at the end. Oh, yeah, That's the stereotype no. physio. Yeah, totally. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so walk I think us a, a, walk us through a console. Um, so most people are going to be listening to this on, on a podcast. So yeah. take that into consideration. So sure. we are going to try and get this on YouTube as well. So for those yeah. of you who want to see this or listening, we'll skip to the end. We'll have the timestamps below and just go to this bit so you can see how Rushab goes through an online physio. But just take me through um, what, how it works and use my shoulder as, a, as an yeah. example. Perfect. So um, we've already got Akash booked into the system. But what I would say is we get them booked into the system. Then you get a notification in your email inbox that sits there um, and it's a Zoom call. Um, we also have our own software that does online physio consults with the camera. And uh, we'll do a whole assessment um, online. So I would ask him questions for so the first 15 to 20 minutes. I actually already know what's going on because you fill out your form. I would just re-emphasize on some of those questions, figure out what's going on. And then from there, I would deduce and I would get him to perform a couple of movement checks. So very similar to a movement screen. And I'll get him to do that. And from there, we will start our rehab program. At the same time, I'm connecting it to his program. So I'm connecting to why you're doing something. For example, Akash, you're struggling with your shoulder today. So Akash, today I'm actually going to test you out a little bit. Um, if I get you to lift your hand um, above your head, okay, do you get that clunking that you were in your first session? And is there sharp pain going into that position at all? So you want me to come in on reflection? On reflection, yeah. No, no, no sharp pain today. Okay, all right, fine. But no, not as sharp pain as when we first um, yeah. met. And if I just get you to hold your shoulder out for me in that sort of flexion position in front of you, like your shoulder height, get the other hand and place it on top. Yeah. And then just want you to push into your hand. So get the other hand to resist and stop it from going anywhere. Thumb up, thumb down. Thumb up is better. Yeah, and then just push it across and see. Can you get that sensation coming on? There is that that pain in the um, yeah. the bone area. Uh, um, yeah. Yeah, so it's exactly. So it's the ACJ area pain, and I would expect that this so at this stage. So <laughs> that, that neck click. Exactly, and for you, that neck click is almost like an associated behavior that you've had with that <laughs> shoulder um, for years, and not just the injury. I think prior to that. So I guess what we're going to do then is actually look at your program and look at your rehab. Um, when I get you doing the band exercise, the one that you pull up um, into a scaption position, which is slightly away from flexion, I want you to just hold it. But how many seconds are you holding it for at the moment? Three seconds. Yeah. So I want to go up to, up to like around five seconds, even just the change in two seconds over the reps and the ranges and the sets that you're going to be doing will make a big difference. So I've just increased your time on okay. that program. The second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get you start doing shoulder presses, but I'm going to get you to put your shoulder in optimum position with five kilos and then start shoulder pressing. The reason why we can still shoulder press because we're not aggravating that specific area, you just have to be very conscious with your mind. And this is where you use your mind muscle connection. So you'll be taking your shoulder into that position, know exactly where you are, then start pressing into your overhead press and then slowly bring down. And what you're trying to feel is that shoulder blade, 
the shoulders, and you're just feeling things and you're seeing what hurts, what doesn't. Again, the rule will apply to you, which is that four out of 10 pain, which is what I want you to sort of maintain your rehab reps on. Yeah. How many reps and sets? So you'll be doing around, so I think for you, the five kilos is a great weight. I think let's just stick to around 12 and three. So we're going to get 12 reps done in three sets. The idea is that you could easily do 15 or you could easily do 20 in three sets. I'm not here to build um, strength as such. I'm here to kind of get the movement happening first. I think the strength will happen over time. The hypertrophic changes will happen over time. But for that, someone like you will need a heavier weight. The other thing we're going to do is I'm going to sort of um, mark into my diary. We're going to have another session, probably the end part of this week, and okay. um, just do an online consult, take you through the specific drills, and then maybe add two or three more uh, rehab programs uh, drills. The last bit is on the app, um, I can actually check when you last did your workouts or when you've last done your um, rehab and what level of pain you were in. So I would ask you specific questions, and then from there, we'd basically book our second session. The second, third, fourth, fifth sessions are all progressively overloading, but the focus is on improving and connecting you back to your bench pressing. Um, and I expect us to have a three-month journey together. So, you know, it's not that we want you to keep you for longer. I just want to see you bench press safely, effectively, to not one bulletproof and two for this injury to not happen again. So, how's this for extra accountability for for both of us? Yeah, uh, it's April the sixth today. I'll be doing my rehab for. Just over three weeks. Two weeks, two weeks now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so let's say the start of June. Yeah. We, there should be a video of me back in the gym bench pressing. Well, let's do that. If, if gyms are open, if not, floor pressing in my home gym. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Floor pressing in your home gym. And I think it's a good guide to have. Now, look, um, I wouldn't say it starts just being defined by deadlines, but I think it's a get, great place to hold accountability for the rehab. Whatever your tendon and the structure happens, whatever happens in there, well and good, but at least you've maintained the rehab and nine out of 10 times, you're bound to get a good lifting happening. You're bound to settle that shoulder down. You're bound to improve it. Um, but over that three month period. Uh, one thing I want to ask is I'm obviously just very, to finish, just to finish that consult. And um, I'll also ask you about uh, what your plans are for the rest of the week. And <laughs> so I connect with your family. <laughs> uh, what I was going to, uh, just on the concept, actually on the, uh, the topic of the consult, what about the other rehab exercise I'm doing? So you've got me doing the, the banded 45 yeah. degree lift. You've got me doing the abduction uh, and you've got me doing uh, the hovers. Yeah, the hovers. So I think that was, that's it. The hovers were quite a humbling one for you. I think you realize that I, can't, I can't hold my body on one hand. And for someone who's able to bench 50 kilos off the floor or 40 kilos or 50 kilos, you are not able to hold your body weight on one hand in that sort of crouched position. So this is something that I would want you to work on still. A couple of the other ones, I'll be rejigging them. And now that you've done three weeks of them, I think I'll, I'll make them a bit more sexier and I'll change a couple of them just to make sure you're not getting too bored. So the boredom is a big part that we look at in our part of a rehab. We really ask you, like, are you tired of them? I would say, I would say having gone through this, boredom in physio and rehab is way higher then people talk about getting bored of a training program, but I think in training there is a there is a case for once you learn the movements, you need to uh, really dive in and continue to focus on progressive development because you spent so long building the neural pathways and the neural patterns. Hmm. Is that same concept applicable to physiotherapy, or is literally it the same? Literally the same concept. So is it there just, a, is there a case of actually embracing the boredom? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The monotony is key because the monotony is also going to help you. Not everything has to be shifted. Not every set needs to be readjusted. Not every exercise yeah. needs to look Instagram worthy. Um, not, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's all about um, changing that neuropathic change to your pain, that changing that sort of nerve connection to the body, to the muscle, to the mind. And over a period of time, resilience is the key. It's building resilience. That's what we're doing here. We're building resilience for you to not have this injury again. Or if you do have the injury, you have the knowledge to rehab yourself. Mm. One thing, uh, one one question, and you may hear this all the time. So I'm, I'm for example, or I've I've been training for ten years, so I've got a good awareness of my body. And if you tell me to flex my arm, I can flex it. I can tell you where I'm pain, where I've got pain. Uh, if you tell me to get to position, I can, you know, with the right cueing, I can do it. What about someone who's more earlier on into the stage? How would you? Yeah. 
how will you do this without being hands-on? What, what's the method of online delivery here? So we have a lot of videos. We have um, our share screen, first of all, and we have videos that are already um, recorded. And most people, once they watch a video, um, they would understand what it should look like mm. and they would try and aim towards as close as possible towards it. I think once they watch something with us and we guide them through it. Okay, so they watch it and then you uh, live guide them through it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So while we're here, I could just share my screen. I could say to you, Akash, this is a video. Let's watch it together. Do you see how this person's moving this bit? They're like, oh yeah, I got it. Okay, now let me see if you can do it. And if you do it correctly, all good. If you don't, that's absolutely fine as well. We'll just work on it together. And we would just literally take that movement and say, let's deconstruct it. Let's change a little bit. Let's change that. Let's change that. Amazing. That's, uh, this is a game-changing uh, concept, I, I personally. Yeah, I think we're five years behind you guys. I think we're five years behind you guys. I think, like you said, you know, the online physio world... All of a sudden, every physio is now offering online physio. Um, the one thing that we know is that this is a game changer for everyone in our industry to now improve on their communication, yeah. how to engage with their clients, how to empower them, but all, most, most important, give value. If I don't give you enough value, um, there is no reason for you to be speaking to me. It's going to weed out a lot of the, the, the bad ones as well because... The quacks, as I call them. Yeah, the yeah, quacks, sure. Like I said, sure. you can't get away with just rubbing their shoulder for 30 minutes anymore. No, and, and you know, I'm not going to be able to sort of, you know, distance um, massage you from, from this screen to the other side. So, yeah, the key here for anyone is going to be you've got to trust the person and the process. But I think the biggest thing for all the physios out there is you've got to inspire that change and you've got to empower these people. Um, and now you don't have the human touch to do it either. So game on. Amazing. Rushab and uh, his team at R&D comp- are well ahead of the curve here. And they've, they've got a, a formalized methodology that's proven not only in person in their, in their successful clinics, but also in the online space as well. So definitely the go-to team uh, to, to, to fix any problems that you may have uh, with your body. Thank you so much, Hakash. I'm super humbled again uh, to be connected to R&T and to have the opportunity to help and serve. Thank Absolutely. You. And if you want to find out more about Rushab, uh, we will link his uh, his details in the show notes here. Uh, he's also he's also uh, contributing content to the RNT page, so check out the online physio section on the on the website. All the links will be put in the show notes. But looking forward to hearing more and more from uh, the experts at R and D and and specifically the founder Rushab Sabda. Thanks for coming on, Rushab. Thank you, Akash. Have a good one. Stay safe. Thank you so much for being here today on this episode of RNT Fitness Radio. I'd love for you to do a quick little favor for us. Please head over to iTunes and give us a five-star rating, leave a comment, and share it with your family and friends. If you're interested in learning more about how to transform your body and positively change your life, go to www.rntfitness.com and explore all our free content on offer. Thank you.